All right. So we ended the last video. You were about to tell us about a fish. That, the only fish in the study you said that's been tournament caught. Yeah, the only one that we know of that was tournament caught. Again, the only reason we know that, I mean, anglers just have to be kind enough to tell us, right? And, and of course, this gentleman did. He uh, caught it in a jackpot tournament out of Canyon Ramp Six Mile in, uh, what month was that? I think in July or August. I actually don't have it written down. But, uh, and it took us about five months to actually go down there and find it. We had so many other tagged fish that were all over the place we just never had time but, but we finally had time I think it was in November I finally went down there with the goal of, of trying to determine where that fish had ended up and sure enough it had just stayed in six mile it when we found it in November first of November it was about halfway out of six mile it wasn't quite out there you know to the uh, boat lane intersection to turn south to, to the sandy branch of six mile and it just stayed right there suspended in the, in the main six mile Creek in that timber suspended around Shad until March or April when it, when it pulled on the South bank uh, there in six mile to spawn. It, so where was this fish originally caught? It was caught in housing straight across from fin and feather out there in deep water off the bite. In the summer, early summer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it turns just, around then know, and swims 10 miles into the back or the middle of six mile. Well, no, it was caught and weighed in at County Ramp six mile. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. I got you. I, I didn't hear that part of her. I did. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. yeah so, anyway, I, I did. I failed to mention that. Yeah. It was weighed in at County Ramp six mile see, and released right there. I don't know six mile that way. Is that the ramp all the way in the back? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. So obviously you just educated speculation that fish just, had no idea where it was, right? So, you know, he just got out there where it felt comfortable, was totally unfamiliar with his surroundings, but it's forced to get comfortable somewhere and, and make a home and not burn too many calories wandering around. So uh, you got to believe that, at least I do anyway, given, given some of this data we have and other studies that have, that have shown that fish can be displaced from tournaments and swim back uh, nine, 10 miles away to where they were caught, that if this fish had been familiar with six mile and its surroundings, I got to believe it would have likely moved back into house. What, what, and I know you've, we've talked about it before. There's been a couple studies. What's the percent of fish tournament caught that typically go home? You know, it's really variable study to study. It just depends on the inherent characteristics of, of the reservoir and, and the habitat conditions where the fish are released. You know, if, if the habitat is real good and, 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 and there's, a lot of forage where, where tournament fish are released, you know, a good many of them may just stay within a mile or two of there. You know, if the, if the uh, habitat's poor or if a fish is just bound and determined to try to get back where it was, then yeah, studies have shown up to 10 to 11 miles, if I recall correctly, of displacement. I don't know of a, of a single study that's shown displacement any further than 10 or 11 miles of fish has made it back. But to your point there, that fish, the, the, the conditions, the, the structure, the water color between uh, housing and six mile is extraordinarily similar. Yes. So that fish would have very easily got comfortable. There's plenty of forage in six mile, just like there is in housing. That's kind of one of those deals where you go on a business trip and it's like, hey, I could live here. And he just said, you know what? It, this is just as good as where I grew up. And assuming he grew up in housing, he just stayed in six yeah. mile. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, we have examples of these fish moving five, six, seven miles from one point to the other. And these, we know that those movements aren't random because they're going right back and forth those same exact areas. So that's why I say educated speculation. If that fish had on its own moved down to six mile here and there and, and point, you know, yeah. had familiarity, yep. I think it would have likely at some point went back to house. But it which just seems like that fish just did not know where it was, right? Which suggests to some degree that it does they really don't have a homing beacon if you will that like you said because it was unfamiliar as far as he knew he was in a completely different lake it seems like yeah it sure seems that way you know we're we're, we're, we're speculating to some degree you know outside of our data but but yeah it seems like fish learn and they they, they learn how to navigate and they some fish develop strong well in fact most of our fish develop strong affinity for small areas it's just some move lots of distance between a couple where others don't hardly move at all over 12 months. And we'll talk about that a little bit 
a little bit later. Let's see what else we have here in terms of individual fish. Uh, we had a three and a half pound fish. Again, this fish was, was a main lake fish. Unfortunately, it moved so far, we, we don't know where the heck it went. We found it one time, two weeks after we tagged it on the north bank of Housen. We tagged it shallow water. And then after that, for almost 12 months, we never, ever got a hit on that fish. And I came real close to just deleting that specific fish out of our uh, uh, telemetry rotation, if you will, but because it was unknown, that's just, I just made that study protocol, right? That unless I know a fish has died, I just keep it in there. But you know, 11, 12 months and we hadn't had a hit, I, I guess I just was lucky that I kept the fish in there because uh, when, when April came back around, we, we had one hit on that fish 100 yards away from where we tagged it an entire year before, presumably moving back in there to spawn. Wow. And after that, there, should, there, there was a little bit of battery life left. We never got a hit on it after that. So that fish, we don't know where, where it was, way, way outside of housing somewhere. It only came back in there to spawn for a small window and right back out again. Two hits on it one year apart and those are the only two hits we had crazy yeah yeah and that's a that's that's a three and a half pound fish there that was that was moving that much and and, and last but not least was that largest fish that we had it was around nine pounds we talked a little bit about this fish before but you know that fish pretty much stayed in 10 feet of water or less for almost all of our observations. It was a shallow Remind the guys where, where and how this fish was caught. You know, that fish was caught by an angler. Uh, what month was it? It was hot. It was middle of summertime. It was caught in less than two feet of water. The lake was still high enough to have a bunch of uh, alligator weed inundated in the back of a little cove. And Because uh, I remember you and I talking offline that this is somewhere you would never go that time of year to try to catch a big one. You know, this fish was, and in, in we after the angler caught the fish, of course, he released it right back where he caught it. And for two months after that, that fish stayed back in there. And that fish was further, I mean, it's a very popular uh, cove with anglers during the spawn. I mean, I mean, it's one of the hottest pockets in all of housing for spawning fish. But it was so far back, even during the peak of the spawn, a mistake I make, obviously, I would have never ventured that far back. I just have the mentality that a fish of that, I mean, a, a four or five pound fish, let alone a nine pound fish, is not going to fight its way back through all this dense flooded brush and alligator weed to get 150 yards back in there in the, in the slop. But that's where this fish was for over two months in June through, I believe, around August 1st. You know, that, that year, the lake, we just had a lot of rain and the lake stayed relatively hot and kept a lot of that stuff uh, flooded. But once the lake fell, you know, once there was six, eight inches of water left, you know, that fish left and moved out to eight or 10 feet of water. But- uh, And talk but, about where that fish went then, because this just fascinates me. Yeah, again, it, it stayed mainly shallow. The deepest we ever saw her was 14 feet. But that fish essentially never really related to traditional structure. You know, it was almost always just on flat water, you know, no drops, no creek channels, nothing like that at all. And, and the flats I'm talking about are pretty much from the back of housing, you know, from, from the pipeline area clear up to uh, the, the south point there before you go into Bull Creek or Jack's Boat Ramp. You know, that whole area to the, to the south there is primarily just pretty flat. You know, the, the housing bayou proper is on that south bank back in there. And that fish was just on that flat uh, eight to 12 feet primarily of water around no structure again, but it was always on, and this just makes good sense, right? It was always on the biggest piece of wood or biggest spider stump that, that you could see. You know, when we, were, when we were drop live scope, when we were getting close to that fish, I mean, nine times out of 10, I could call, call where that fish was 70, 80 feet out in front of me because I could see just a huge 
lay down log or just a, a, a three or four foot tall, huge diameter stump. So that fish was picking the prime, the, the most prime woody cover available in the area. But it was on the, the, this expansive flat that you, I, nor anybody else is going to use what they know and their electronics and their, and their mapping and drive right to that fish and fish for it. That's just not going to happen. And I've got more data along those lines. That was probably one of the most eye-opening observations, you know, when we pull all these observations together from a fishing perspective that really hit home for me is what percentage of our fish avoid that traditional structure. You know, they don't really get out in depths of water to get away from us, but they get on these expansive flats 100 plus yards away from drops or points that are more like needle in a haystack you know, trying to fish for those fish. Would you approach that fish with a trolling motor? Yeah, well, you know, one th we really haven't talked about the, the details of the methodology, but, but it's probably good we didn't because we'll get into that as we talk more about specific data with all the fish pooled. Because, yeah, you know, we also looked at effects of uh, outboard motor noise, effects of fishing for the fish, effects of uh, boat slap or trolling motor noise while we were fishing for these fish. We looked at behavioral effects of all that as we as we pinpointed these fish so we'll get into that as we, as we continue the discussion are there any more from that first round of fish individual fish we should talk about because we're about 12 minutes into this one that's it in terms of those individual fish from that first batch you know all the rest of the fish what's interesting about those is they had a very small typically a half to one mile home range and hardly ever varied out of those areas and, and, and this some is of your second fish. batch of fish right well that that's the other half of the first batch you know we talked okay. about eight or nine to the 19 from the first batch the rest of the first batch were pretty boring you know if, if anything was interesting was what little they moved and were there any big fish in that sample of fish yes we had a couple of more over six pounds in that first batch and they just moved very very little yes so those are the more traditional fish you and I are catching. Yeah, and you know it. You know, probably a, a third of our overall fish, and 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 when we move into this latest batch, I mean they're 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 even more boring. You know, they there just wasn't many of those doing interesting things. So uh, a good many of our fish, and, and and this makes good sense, right? Get, given the nature of Toledo Bend, it's so productive. It's got so much woody cover. It's got so much structure. Forage or is everywhere, whether it's crayfish, you know, sunfish or shad. If a fish just doesn't, by golly, want to, it's just not going to move much. It just had, it has no inherent biological reason to. And, and the majority of our fish did just that. They just didn't move much. Um, there was a fish... And it seems like it was a five poundish fish that you caught and then subsequently tracked on the steps on the back of a boat dock. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Did that, what, which, talk about that fish. Well, first off, you know, it gets, of course, it's part of the study, right? I mean, we're trying to harass these fish with noise, you know, that's what we're trying to look at in terms of behavioral effects. So uh, when we, when we stop and fish for these fish, you know, just study protocol, what we've already done is we've already idled over that fish twice doing a couple of figure eights, mimicking how we as anglers idle over structure looking for the fish. We've already done that. So we've already harassed the fish some, probably put it on edge, and this even includes fish in just three or four feet of water. What's crazy about that particular fish is it was on, I just presumed, because the, the, the dock was so long and so shallow that it was on the very end of it. Water was about three feet deep. You know, we'd done, we uh, went through our protocol out of right by the end of that dock twice within three feet of the fish and three feet of water. Went by it twice, uh, put the antenna on the fish. Hey, still hasn't moved. That fish pretty stubborn. If a fish doesn't move after we do the idling, then we fish for it. So I fish for the fish and I don't remember what cast it was. I make five casts at that point, whether I catch it or not. And yeah, it was the first or second cast, if I recall, uh, that, that fish bit right under that dock, even after we dialed right by it. And uh, catch the fish, release it. Where did it go? I mean, it raced right back underneath there, right where it was, it stayed put. Sure did. Were you able to observe that fish again two weeks later in the same dock? We observed it two weeks later. It, 
whether it was on that same dock or no, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it repeatedly was there. Uh, that wasn't the only time it was on that dock. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But I never caught that fish again. And I only, I've only caught three of these fish and I forget it's close to 200 fishing observations. And Maybe I've only you caught probably three. catch 200 fish, 200 different times. Yes. And I've only caught three of them. Now, all those 200, am I able to see that individual fish on live scope? No, some of them I can, but as, as listeners familiar with Toledo Bend know, I mean, there's so much dense woody cover on that lake. So often these fish are loners and they're really hugged real tight to that wood where, you know, you can, you, you can speculate where they are in terms of the, the, the biggest piece of wood or, or, or what have you, but, uh, you know, I, I can't see every one of these fish is what I'm saying, but still, uh, I know the fish within plus or minus five or 10 feet, this location. Absolutely. I know that. You're that accurate with the telemetry data, but telemetry antenna. Yes. When you're, I mean, it's, it's super, super directional, right? I mean, when you're, when you're within 10 or 20 feet of a fish, the signal is so, so strong when you're pointing the antenna right at it to where as soon as that fish laterally moves or, 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 or move straight to the boat five or 10 feet, you instantly know it. You instantly Great place to take a quick break. So when we come back, we still got, we still got a lot. We got yeah. some individual fish talk from the second batch and then your kind of overall observations. And, you know, one of my last questions to you is going to be, how has this impacted your tournament fishing? Right. So let's take a break. We'll come back with part four guys. Man, that's some good stuff. Yeah, and to me, a lot of the good stuff is the overall data where, where we look at frequency of movement of the bass, uh, suspended on the bottom, schooling nature, all that stuff we still have to talk about. You know, the, right, the 2021 individual fish discussion, not much to it. They're just pretty boring. So I'm going to stop this recording so I have smaller batches stop recording. <laughs> 